Hello folks, this is another one for the FAQ section. I got an email the other day and it went like this. I spent the last little while practicing with a Sangha at a fairly large Zen temple, but recently I've had to move several hours away to help run my family's farm in a rural area. What is your advice about practicing with minimal support or potentially planting a Sangha where one doesn't already exist? Well, I've done a lot of practicing with minimal support. I mentioned this in an earlier video, but when I first started doing Zazen, I was living with somebody who was a born-again Christian. Don't ask. Embarrassing. Don't want to go there. But the upshot is, for the sake of this video, that she was not very supportive of me doing this uh, devilish voodoo Buddhism stuff. So I had to kind of practice, not exactly in secret, but I had to do it in um, when she wasn't around or before she woke up and, and all this stuff. And, you know, she would always accidentally interrupt my practice, you know, when it was going on. It, but I persevered anyway. Sometimes I wonder myself why, because there doesn't seem to be anything in my background that would particularly predispose me to wanting to do Zazen, but I did. I think it was just because I saw the effectiveness of it on my life and I didn't want to give it up. So I kept on going. After that, I moved to Chicago for a while and what you folks don't know, probably wouldn't guess uh, given my what I do these days, I am painfully shy and have a lot of social anxiety. So I was uh, going to these sanghas, there were a couple of them I found in Chicago but I, I couldn't get up the nerve to talk to anybody and I'd kind of put out this spiky vibe that would keep people away from me, you know, and if they'd, if they'd talk to me at all, I'd just sort of grunt like, you yeah, know, and walk out. The result was I didn't go to those sanghas very often and I spent most of my time practicing alone. There wasn't any such thing as uh, the internet back in those days, kids. So I couldn't even go on YouTube and watch a video like this one or like, you know, a dozen or more that you can find at the tip of your fingers to get some support that way. Nothing like that existed. If Buddhist magazines existed in those days, I didn't know about them because they weren't on the local newsstand next to the Playboys and Sports Illustrated. So, you know, I just did it on my own and read books when I could find them. You know, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, I probably read a dozen times. Buddha is the Center of Gravity, a few, the few books that were out there, I read them, you know, until they were just about to crumble to pieces. And that's, that's how I did it. And, and I think if I can do it, anybody can. Then after that, after Chicago, I ended up moving to the infamous clubhouse and nobody there was kind of... Uh, against my sitting zazen but you know it was a place it was like one of these places where a bunch of broke people pool their money together to live in a house where nobody else wants to and and so we can make noise because nobody cares about the, the house and the neighborhood and all this it's kind of sad but trying to sit zazen while a band is playing and trying to to uh, deal with the the parties going on and 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 people you know, just people just hanging out and getting high and watching bad TV reruns, Hogan's Heroes and Green Acres and whatnot. I mean, those temptations are there too. But you got to kind of have a bit of focus. And I don't know how to, I don't know, there's no magic word I can give you for how to have a bit of focus. But you just got to want to do it, I think. You just got to, you just got to just do it. You know, you just do it even though you don't want to. You know, that's, a, that's an important thing, too. The times when you don't want to do Zazen, do it anyway. Because, you know, you'll feel better afterward. As far as planting a Sangha, I don't think there's any real problem in, you know, hanging out your shingle or putting up some flyers or making a Facebook page because it's the modern era now. It's the 21st century that says, you know, I sit Zazen in my garage at 7.30 every night, and if you want to join me, come on and with the address if you want to do that. I, as long as you're not misrepresenting yourself as like a great enlightened master or, or, you know, saying you hold the lineage in something, which I've run into both of those things on my travels of people who, who pretend to be, you know, what they're not and lead little sanghas. But just as often I've run into great little sanghas of people who are just, you know, getting it together and doing it and not worrying about not having a teacher or, a, you know, a, a approved leader or whatever. The only caution I would give you 
in that regard is watch out for any sort of signs that you're enjoying a little too much the prestige of being the leader. I mean, of course, somebody has to be the leader. Somebody has to organize things and get it together and provide the space and so on. And so there's nothing intrinsically bad about being the leader of a, a Zen group. But there's a lot of things people project on anyone they perceive as a spiritual authority figure of, of any kind. It doesn't matter how humble you are. And the other thing that will happen is you suddenly become attractive. Even if you were never attractive to anyone before, you'll suddenly be attractive as the leader of your little group so watch out what you do with that and watch out if there's temptations going along you know the obvious things that can happen that might be pleasurable in that regard my advice there is don't uh, and i and i say that it don't as advice more than a rule because uh, you know sometimes people can make it work out a relationship that develops under those circumstances but you got to be really careful because a lot of projection and weirdness can go on and that projection and weirdness, by the way, goes both directions. We hear a lot in the, the media about it going the, the direction where it's the spiritual master, in quotes, you know, abusing the student. It, it can go the other way, too, and we never hear about that because people don't want to talk about that because it's like blaming the victim and all that. But I'll tell you what, it happens, and I've seen it happen going the other direction. So it's as much about protecting yourself as it is about you know, not doing harm. And both are important. So, so be sure to balance both ends. But as long as you're not you know, pretentiously advertising yourself as something you're not or you know, using your position of authority in bad ways, then I say go, go for it. Have your little Zen group and, and you know, meet in your garage or your, your living room or wherever you want to meet, and it'll be just fine. So that's my advice. There you go. Uh, and just to remind you, I get supported by you via PayPal and Patreon links that are below, not in my lap, but below this video. That's how I make my living. That's how it all happens. My new book, Letters to a Dead Friend About Zen, is coming out in October, so get yours today well you can't get yours today not if you're watching it today the day i put up this video but you'll be able to get it in about a month and that'll be fun and i hope you will and we'll talk to you later bye